Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome back to the sixth episode of my Chatterbox podcast. You join me, Sir Meerkat, and I'm also joined here today by my lovely father, Papa Meerkat. How are you today, Dad? Well, I'm good, thanks very much. I've never been called Papa Meerkat before. I know. <laughs> you and your brother tend to call me Pa. So, Papa Meerkat, well, I guess that sounds fun. That works. Yeah, yeah that yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. cool. Um, about the camp, we're in a bit of a different room. This is another room in my house. We couldn't quite fit in my bedroom today. So, moved it down here. Obviously, my dad's not a YouTuber. I don't think he even really knows how to get onto YouTube. True. So, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he obviously doesn't have any equipment or anything. So, having to use just my camera, hopefully it picks up the audio and stuff okay. I'm sure it'll be fine. We're pretty relaxed. So, firstly, before we start in any questioning, we're going to go through our meal deals for today. What have you got today with your, your I sandwich have got and crisps? Chicken and bacon. Chicken and bacon and mayo. And I've got nice. some McCoy's salt and vinegar. Oh, nice. they're not. They're cheese and onion. Cheese and onion. I asked yep. for salt and vinegar, but you I've didn't. Got you want some cheese and onion. And, onion. and I've got it's a dark line. coke. Very much need a dark coke because I was spending a whole week drinking alcohol. Nice. So, <laughs> uh, we've had friends staying here. <laughs> And uh, well, our, my fans are going to think you're an alcoholic. Our staycation. I mean, you are, but well, we had a lot of drinking, especially last night. So anyway, nice. dark coat today. Nice, good. So that's my meal deal. Very kind well, of you. you. Thank you very much. No problem. So yeah, I paid for that somehow. Somehow that's happened. Uh, I got southern fried chicken, same as I had in the Tomo podcast, I believe. Uh, then I got McCoy's salt and vinegar. Apparently, what Dad wanted, but even not. He he also cheese on you. And then I've got a Lucas Aid as well because I need some sugar. I've just I had my last shift at Sainsbury's yesterday. Amazing, uh, but obviously had to get up early and do this, so needed a bit of sugar to to get me going. Good. But yeah, let us know in the comments what you thought of our meal deals, what you think of that. So you're, the sandwich you're having is definitely my favourite. So yeah. I didn't want to get the same as you, so I, I, I picked that instead. But it's a good choice, I'd say. Pretty decent little meal deal there for you. Right, so I'm gonna jump in straight with the first question. I know you've earned, you've owned a few cars over your lifetime. Mm -hmm. If you could only keep one car for the rest of your life out of cars that you've owned either ones that you own now or ones that you've owned in the past mm -hmm. what would you choose no what idea. would you think that is a question you can pick a few we'll give you we'll give you a few choices you don't have to okay stay on one but if you can just think of a couple well i've owned 109 cars bloody hell i didn't quite realize it was that many yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so cars come and go don't they you know we've got a few at the moment about 15 i think it is at the moment isn't it Something like that. Um, but, um, which is great, and uh, I always enjoy cars for what they are. Um, is there a car that I would say was the car I would want to keep forever? Well, it's very difficult to answer that, because actually I like cars, different cars do different things. Like, I've got that in the Range Rover tomorrow to tow the Caterham because I'm doing a sprint. So the Range Rover is fantastic. The Caterham's a sprint car, brilliant. But would I choose one or the other? Well, probably not really. I think probably one of the most memorable cars was the uh, Ferrari 458 Spider that we bought back in 2012. Nice um, we would had it on order, we got a 430 at the time. 458 was arriving and we managed to be able to go and pick it up from the factory. And that was, that was very special. That was a very special car, we had it for a year. We sold it and actually retained the 430. Because we were sort of enjoying the 430 more. But, that was uh, more with the electronics, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that's right. I think that is right. Um, I wouldn't say there is any one particular car that I would say is the car that I would keep out of everything. I mean, we're about to sell the Turbo Targa 911. I've owned that for 26 years and people would say to me, well, that's a keeper forever. Well, actually, not, not really. It's all in beautiful condition now because we've had it all done up. And because it's so nice, we're actually saying, well, we'll never use it now because it's too nice to use. So we're selling it more as an investment vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, life without a catering would be difficult, I think. Yeah. Whether it's racing or track daying or sprinting. But of course, they're not highly practical. That's where the no. Golf R comes in, isn't it? They don't have much boot space, do they, no, they don't, no. The Golf R is fantastic. What a car that is. Mm. Um, you know, it really is the business. Um, so I don't think I can answer that as being one. I knew you wouldn't one. like it as a first question. No, but I it's quite difficult to jump one. in with something. But also, difficult. a car that I like now, I might not like in a year's time. Or That's a true. car that I really loved a few years ago, 
I don't like anymore and you have to move on, you know, so uh-huh. cars come and go, I guess. There you go. That's a little insight into, into your cars anyway. Okay. So, have you always been into cars? So, the, this podcast is genuinely going to be quite interesting to me as well, because I don't think we've ever really sat down and chatted in depth about motorsport history. I was there for a bit of it, but equally I was a, ch- a child for a lot of it, so I don't really remember it hugely. Yeah. When did you get into cars? Was it when you were a little kid? Yeah. Was it, was it, so it was when you were yeah. a kid. What initially got you into it then when you were a child? Was it watching Well, my dad or? was keen on cars, okay. but my dad never had any money. So he loved watching cars. And obviously we had a road car, we had a Beetle for most of the time. Um, but he didn't really have any money. He couldn't indulge that passion and enthusiasm. But it certainly rubbed off on me. I was always keen on cars. Cars were my thing all the time. So as a kid, I was into cars, whether it be matchbox cars, corgi toys, scale trick, you know, all the rest of it. And I wanted to drive just as soon as I could. And I couldn't get started in cars at age 16, which is when the license was for cars when I was young, because they changed it the year before I became... 16 to move it to 17. That's annoying. So that was really annoying. Yeah. But anyway, I managed to, um, uh, well, acquire my dad's moped. So I used the moped for a year, 16 to 17, yeah. never bothered with motorbikes, straight into a car at 17. Nice. And I bought my first car. I passed my test very quickly um, and then bought a Ford Corsair. You won't know what that is, but it was a Bit of a variation on a Ford Cortina Mark I'm sure One. Some people out there will. will Fifteen hundred cc pre-cross flow engine, very basic. We paid fifty-five pounds for it, and I shared fifty-fifty with my mate Tony. He couldn't drive, I could, but we shared all the bills, and we went everywhere together, and it was great fun. Nice. Um, so that was my first car, but I'd always been into cars big time, and um, I was buying and selling cars at college. I ran a business at college of buying and selling cars to make money to help pay all my fees. I went to Bristol to do my degree. Um, Parents really didn't have money to finance me. We did get grants in those days, but you needed more money. So I bought and sold cars to create money to help pay for my college. So that certainly was a part of passion of being involved in cars. And I always wanted to do things competitively in cars and when I was at school and I was 17 I bought a Cortina GT to do rallying but we weren't very successful and the car broke down on the first night we had to put a new gearbox in the next day down to the scrapyard new gearbox 12 quid for a gearbox second hand of course popped that in entered another event didn't get on very well we quickly realized you need money to do any motorsport I didn't have any money Uh, I was working hard as I could at various part-time jobs but I didn't really have any money and it was jolly challenging. So I got out of that and thought, actually, I better make money. I better go and get a job and try and create some money so that one day I can do it in a proper way. Cars, racing, whatever it was going to be. So I did all sorts of bits and bobs like karting and all that kind of stuff, as you do. Yeah. Uh, but frankly, couldn't afford to do racing or anything like that for years. So I spent my early years building my business activities, earned money, but of course then married, uh, house, mortgage, children, all the expenses of life. Um, It wasn't until I was uh, about 40 that I could afford to go racing. I'd done numerous track days in various cars, 911s and stuff like that, which I really enjoyed. But what I really wanted to do was go racing. Uh, But you can't do it without money because I didn't really have the technical skills I needed people to help me and I needed the backup and all the rest of it so I needed the money to help pay for it Um, and uh, back in 98 I decided right we can now afford it mum agreed that we could spend money uh, which was great went and got my did my ARDS test got my license and bought a catering did you do any like tuition or anything before you no. actually started or you just jumped no. straight in? No, no I didn't. Close. What happened there was um, um, bought the case, I decided a load of research, what was I going to raise? 750 Motor Club ran a championship really for catering. One mate racing and you could buy a 1400cc Rover powered car, 130 horsepower 
um, buy a second hand race car for not a lot of money. And I found one, really nice condition. I paid 11 grand for it, bought a trailer for about 1,500 quid. We'd already got a Land Rover, uh, which mum used to take you guys to school and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and um, so I thought, right, I'm going to go racing. Decided to go racing at the start of 99. And I remember my first race, I mean, it was just amazing. I'd done a couple of track days in this track car, this race car, the Caterham. I thought I'm really eager for my first race. Um, unfortunately, the uh, I was on a track day, sort of test day at Mallory Park. It must have been about March, this and is this was 1999. Yeah. And um, somebody had dumped a load of oil at the at Devil's Elbow. I came herring through Devil's Elbow, hit the oil, spin, 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 bang, bang, bang car was a right mess and we were only about two weeks before the first race car was a mess put it on the trailer there was one business at the time called arrow star who were the known sort of experts uh, i thought get the car there get it repaired fast so that i can make the first race they made a load of promises said they'd get it done they didn't i missed the first race so i went to um, donnington where was that first race supposed to be? Don Donington. Oh, okay. I went to watch the people racing. I should have been racing. I didn't have a car. Right. Went to watch, see what it was all about. was really excited, um, but um, wasn't able to race. Anyway, the car did get fixed. I was able to make the first race for me, second race for the championship, which was Mallory Park. And um, we had about 28 cars uh, on the grid. And you go out and do qualifying, 15 minutes of qualifying. Um, to set the pace, I managed to qualify 21st out of 28, so I wasn't last, I was delighted with that. Nice. And I got my new yellow suit on, the yellow the car, I was known as the Banana Man, you know, nice. so that was all great. And then um, lined up on the, on the start was, line. Was there any reason why you chose yellow? Yeah, I just fancied it really, no, I just fancied it. It, looked, it looked good, you can't buy yellow suits anymore, they oh, don't exist. Right. Um, I mean, it fits in with the Moto Mirka branding well, the yellow. So, I suppose it does. There you go. Mm. Bit of linkage there. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, so you started your first, yeah, your first race, well their second race, but your first race, what was that like? Oh, um, I mean just amazing, the whole excitement and nervousness, because you've done your quality, you survived, great, 21st out of 28, you wait for your race to be called and you turn up, you do the um, lining up bit, you know, where you go round, a lap and you all line up two by two by two by two by two yep. and now I'm, I'm 21st net you know 22nd alongside me and the tummy is just going unbelievable i can imagine now. absolutely unbelievable thinking i've got to get it off the line yeah, mustn't don't stall, stall it <laughs> don't stall it you know make progress even if you get a bad start just don't stall do it. not stall it i mean that's awful you know especially i mean i was 21st out of 28 so i was quite a long way to the back yeah but the, your tummy's going absolutely wild. You've already been to the loo about three times and you're in there and you, and you, the lights come on and the lights go out and off and you get this incredible release, absolute release of that sort of pent up yeah. fright all goes as the adrenaline, you know, flows and you're off. Yeah. And you're in this melee of activity of cars just here, there and everywhere. Absolutely incredible. I mean, it, the race only lasted about 20 minutes. 15, 20 minutes, something like that. But I've never been so excited about something in all my life. It was unbelievable. And I got through it and I finished 13th. Nice. Uh, and I hadn't smashed the car up. I hadn't caused anything to come off. I finished 13th. I thought, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Came in and uh, uh, we're two races in a day. So the second race, you start the position you finished the first race. Right. So uh, second race comes up, you know, about half past four or something like that. We're all getting ready for that. Uh, line up 13th, off we go, all the same sort of scenario. Fight, 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 all over the place. Short race, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it was. And I finished 12th. And I came in and I was just hooked. That was it, I knew this is absolutely what I want to do. Nice. Um, and I finished 12th and I, I hadn't had a problem. And so I spent the rest of that year racing that car, two two, meet, two races at each meeting, all the way through the year. And things improved as time went by. And by the end of the year, I think I'd had a podium. Nice. Uh, I think I hadn't had a win, I don't think. 
but I'd had a, I think I'd had a third. Yeah, I think I'd had a third, that's right. And I thought, right, fantastic, it's been a great fun year. Learned a lot. Next year is going to be amazing and I'm going to really get into it and do the job properly. And of course you close down around about September time, October time. Yeah. Nothing happens over winter. Um, well, apart from yours truly. Oh, winter. Well, there was, there was a massive uh, <laughs> change of circumstances, of course, because, yeah, you arrived. Um, well, also, we uh, had that si interesting situation, the fact that um, Mum had had a new car in early 99. She had a Lotus Elise. It was a fun car in the March. And then by about May, June, we found that you were expected. <laughs> so there wasn't much point keeping that car. So that car had to be sold yeah, in that's, September. That's and that's when we bought that 911 What's worth more, Lotus Elise or Moto Meerkat? Well, that's the question. <laughs> I think I know what, what I'd pick. There, there's a debate, <laughs> but that's the subject of discussion, I guess. But uh, <laughs> so you arrived in the December of '99. That's right, and we were keen to go racing again the next year. Um, and um, is it appropriate to carry on then with that discussion about what happened then and? Yeah, yeah, we're going to move on to the year after anyway. The 2000 yeah. season? Yeah. Okay. The second season. The second season. Got the so experience now. Got a bit of experience, got to know all the people racing, a load of people registered for the championship for the next year, eager to crack on. First race in the second year was um, Mallory Park. Um, it was March the 12th, I think the date was. Pretty sure it was March the 12th, 2000. How can you remember a specific date of well, that it was, and it, not remember what we had for dinner last night? Well, it was a pretty pretty big day for me because uh, it, it went very wrong, didn't it? Yes. That um, was the first race. First race. First race, okay. Yeah, so I, well, I was going to ask about that because uh, at Toddy Boy on Instagram did ask what was the biggest crash you've ever been in hmm. and what was it like? So I guess this sort of... Leads. I'm assuming that that is the, well, the one in 2000 is your biggest. Well, I've had a few. Um, a few big ones. Um, we can talk them through as we go through like yeah. the seasons. Yeah. But this one at Mallory, your first big one. Yeah. I imagine that was. Mm -hmm. What was the what, what what happened? Well, what was it like? The good news is that I was racing with a full roll cage. Caterums can be very dodgy if you don't have a full roll cage. If it's you roll, some like the guy you were racing against had just a hoop. Didn't you he? did. One or two people at that time did bit. just have hoops. But um, I don't know uh, really whether there was a particular reason, but anyway, the over-exuberance of the start of the season, people were dead keen to get on, yep. race rusty, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, I can't remember where I qualified. We head off in the race. We're about halfway into the race, and um, I'm dicing with a guy for fifth or fourth, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the way you overtake in a caterham is all about slipstreaming. Because they've not got any natural um, aerodynamic abilities, they're like mm -hmm. a brick going through the air. So you come behind your competitor and you get a good tow, then you pop out of the tow and you sail by and then carry on around the next bend. Yep. Uh, and that's the way you overtake and you go up the field, you know. Uh, and I was doing quite well, I was fourth or fifth, something like that. And um, a guy was behind me who was a competent, able racer, but he didn't prove so to be particularly that day, sadly. He came behind me, down through Devil's Elbow, we're on the start, finish straight, he got a good tow, came out alongside me, started to come by me, we're on the start, finish straight, right by the pits, but instead of just carrying on as you head towards the uh, big bend at the bottom, I can't remember what that's called now, um, he, for some reason, jumped to the right as though to block me uh, before going into Gerrard's, it's called, the Big Ben Gerrard's. We were a long way from Gerrard's. There was no need to do that manoeuvre. We're travelling at well over 100 miles an hour. He jinxed to the right and his right rear caught my left front and that speared me into the end of the pit lane barrier at something in excess of 100 miles an hour. The car hit it hard went up, over, landed on its nose, and then went over, over, over three times. It was like being in a washing machine. Yeah. Uh, 
and uh, unbelievable really I mean we didn't have car video we didn't have video the way no. we do now or anything that was like amazing that. on video yeah to catch that up. so didn't have any of that there are one or two pictures that we managed to keep yeah. of the car sat on its wheels it landed on its wheels I didn't really know what was going on I did know that I had to let go of the steering wheel because if you're holding the steering wheel and you've got your thumbs round it and the steering gets hit the wheel spins round and it breaks your thumbs so I yeah. let go of the steering wheel as I hit it bang it went over and over and over um, I was not wearing arm restraints and wearing caterums really you should wear arm restraints they, they don't impinge on your ability to drive the car but they're very very good in case you have a rollover incident um, went over um, when you're going over the centrifugal force is so enormous you don't realize it but your arms just come out yeah. and uh, this arm came out and caught between the cage and the ground as we went over it just went straight through and smashed this arm really really badly Jesus. it landed on its wheels um, and then there was this amazing silence because the car had switched itself off yeah. which was great and so there was no fuel pumping or anything like that it was not yeah. on fire it was on its wheels and I thought what the fuck was that you know what had happened um, and I, I sort of moved I thought I can move my neck and I felt yeah I can I think I can move my legs and I could move I thought I think I'm probably all right and then I realized that this arm was hanging uh, just because I've got gloves on and my race yeah, suit and everything held together by and then this complete silence and then suddenly the pain as so this yeah. just went like immediate, oh yeah. real awful pain and I knew that something bad had happened I didn't know it was broken and and smashed up because I couldn't see anything yeah. um, but it, it started to be really uncomfortable and then all these people were around me um, and um, they wanted to get me out of the car but they're nervous that you've broken your neck that's the yeah and so they wanted to cut the car up to get me out on a stretcher yeah. and the medical people wanted to give me a um, shot of morphine to calm me down and for me to get more comfortable you said yes please well, I don't remember really saying a lot. I don't really remember. Uh, there was a lot of melee going on. Um, of course, whilst this was happening, um, Mum and you and your brother, who was eight at the time, were up watching the race and had realised that there had been an incident. Um, so they were a different part of the track. They were a different part of the track, but they hadn't seen it because it was further round from where so you... So you were with... Gary, the mechanic, weren't you? Yeah. Day? So it, was he on the pit wall? Yeah. So he saw what happened. Yeah. Bloody hell. Gary was looking after me, doing all the. It was his first race where he was looking after me. Oh my God. Mm. Jesus, that's a baptism of fire. During the first yeah, year, yeah. I was doing it a lot myself. Bloody hell. Doing the fetching and carrying and all the rest of it. <laughs> um, but I realised that you need proper support. Yeah. Gary's going to take the role on looking after the car, looking after me at the race meetings. So it was his first meeting with us. He towed the car up um, and he saw the whole thing from the pit wall. So, you know, must have thought, bloody hell, you know, this isn't, this isn't good. Yeah. Tried to go over to see what's happening, but everybody was kept away. They put like a big, big sheet up so that people can't see what's going on whilst they're dealing with the, with the incident. And that was the same with mum and myself. Yeah, and so they couldn't well. see what was going on. So Tony, my mate, was with you and... David and Mum, yeah, you went down to try and see, you know, Mum's holding on to you, you're only 10, 12 weeks old. Um, David's obviously frightened that his dad's dead or something like that, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. Mum's not too happy either, so really, really difficult. Anyway, uh, I wasn't dead, please, please to be able to Good. say. Yeah. Um, but I was in a bad way. Anyway, they eventually cut the car up, they got me out, They, I was sent to the medical centre, and then Mum was allowed to come over with you. And um, I think um, I, I was then needed to be bundled off to the local uh, hospital, which was in uh, Leicester, I think. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we got taken off. Mum came, I think she came in a car. No, she, I think she came in the ambulance with me yeah, and so. you. And then somebody brought the car. I think Tony brought the car. And then David... <laughs> went back with Gran, I think. Somebody, I think Tony took David back to Gran and he stayed with, stayed with Gran. I was in the hospital and I was lined up on a, on a trolley 
with loads of people who got broken ankles playing football Sunday afternoon. Right. And there was me all, all smashed up. And um, uh, I was dosed up with plenty of morphine. Um, but, you know, it wasn't good. But they, they might do operations on a Sunday afternoon. So the idea is they make you comfortable and they'll do the operation on the Monday. Right. So they put a temporary cast on this yeah. and then did the operation on the Monday. Where they, because uh, what had happened was the two bones in here in your arm had been smashed completely yeah. apart. Oh. So instead of being like that, they're like that. Oh. And they won't grow back together because they're too far apart. So they've got to be moved back together. And then they put steel or some kind of metal yeah. bars along each bit and they drill through. So that's why there's all these bolts in here. Yeah. Put it all back together and then put a plaster on it um, and you recover. Or well, that's in theory what happens anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 was, I had a pretty uncomfortable time in the hospital. And I, in fact, I checked myself out on the Wednesday morning. I couldn't stand being there. Checked myself out, got back here, and I was in charge of, uh, put in charge of Epsom, uh, at Epsom Hospital, who were looking after me whilst this recovered. I had a lot of business to do, and I needed to get on. So I was working again yeah. by the Thursday. Jesus. The disappointment was that they... Um, uh, well, disappointment, situation. The re the race was red flagged, um, and I think I was fifth or something like that in the race because they go back to the end of the previous lap, and I think right. I was in yeah. fifth. Um, mm -hmm. But they wouldn't declare it a result until they'd had the results of the inquiry, um, and then right. we had a big inquiry as to what had happened and what went wrong. Right. Um, and there was a big argument, and that was the start of a lot of arguments from end of March right through until the summer where we had to deal with judicial proceedings right. because I was being accused of um, dangerous driving yeah. whereas it's entirely the other guy's fault mm -hmm. um, but we had to argue our case in front of a big committee sort of a semi-legal arrangement um, I was then found not guilty and he was found guilty he was banned for six months or something I was reinstated and my points were reinstated and then uh, we had another semi-legal situation because we were accused of bringing the club into disrepute. And again, I then had to fight that. Uh, and again, I won my case, I'm pleased to say. The other guy lost his case. Um, and uh, the club made a formal apology uh, to me for making the initial statement that I brought it into disrepute. Mm -hmm. And I asked that there be a statement in autosport. And there was. They, Marcus Pye issued a little note saying that I'd been found uh, innocent of all charges and yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, I'm a club racer and I expect to be helped out by the club. And, yeah. and, and, and that was that. But, but by, I wanted to go racing again. That car was destroyed. It, it had cost me £11,000 um, plus all the costs of getting it race ready. It was totally destroyed. Yeah. Everything about it was totally destroyed. Yeah. It needed a new chassis. The engine was, still was fine. So Gary then started rebuilding that as a as a road car which we subsequently sold and we bought an ex-championship winning car in the april nice. uh, i'm recovering from my incident you're supposed to keep this thing on for six weeks i got it off to five and once you've got it off you can start doing all of the physio because it's all about the physio and getting yeah, the movements like back because initially this all withers away you've got no muscle yeah and you're in a right mess but you've got to work hard at the physio to get it working properly and get the flexibility and all the rest of it. I booked to do a race in um, May, um, but actually I wasn't didn't feel fit enough to do that. But I did race beginning of June. I think it was the 11th of June up at Cadwell Park in the new car that we'd bought. So how long was that between the crash and about the 11 next weeks? Jeez, week? I was about five weeks with this and about six weeks of. Physio. recovery of physio until right. I was physically okay enough to do it right. and um, went, went back in um, and uh, I remember the first race after the incident af we were off racing and it just felt like people were trying to knock me off I had this incredible feeling that yeah. people were trying to knock into me or and knock me off that lasted a few laps but actually it then went and I've never That's had good. that feeling again that all good. went and you just get on with it and um you know, try and do as well as you can. Mm -hmm. I remember when I had my first win now. But they always say, once you've had your first win, you can go on and, you know, start to do well. Yeah. And I was really enjoying it. And um, I decided at the end of that season, 
I wanted to move up and try and do a different series, different championship. I bought a more um, powerful car. That was an 1800, 200 horsepower car. Um, and I ran that in the factory championship, the Caterham factory championship, but it ran on slick tires and it was very that expensive. What was that? That was 2002. Really? Okay. Yeah. I didn't think you moved on to the factory one that quick. Mm, yeah, I did. <clears throat> um, and it was on slick tyres, so I did um, 99 and 2000, no it was 2001, that's right, um, I, on slick tyres. I didn't do too well because you need a big budget to spend on tyres, and right. these were powerful cars, it was great racing, exciting, but I was only a best a mid, mid-pack mid runner, right. partially because of budget um, and the like, and partially because I, I wasn't quite good enough at that time. Mm -hmm. So the next year after that, I left the Caterham Factory Championship and went back to 750 Motor Club to run that car, but in the Group A series, whereas I had been running in Group C in the 1400 car. Right. So I ran the Group A, it's in Group A, which is on treaded tyres, so much less expensive in terms of tyre budget, and was having a lot of fun in 2002, mm -hmm. and I did pretty well that year. And then 2003... I started in the same championship with that car, the two litre car, uh, 1800 car, 200 horsepower, and had a great season. And I was nip and tuck all the way through with um, Martin, um, I can't remember his surname now, Martin, lovely, lovely guy who was really competitive. Um, and we were nip and tuck that every was the race. Guy in the green car with the hoop, wasn't That's it? That's yeah. it, yeah. I was yeah, going to yeah. talk about him because I was going to talk about moving forward onto the, your 2003 season mm -hmm. was when you had a pretty good championship battle mm. didn't you can you talk us through so that's the same cars you had then in 2002 same one carried over uh and then you're fighting this bloke you're pretty close in the championship mm. comes down to the last round at snetterton that's right and can you talk us through i had a number of wins he had a number of wins we were nip and tuck but the really interesting thing was that the championship could have been won by Anybody in either Group A and B or C and D. Right. Um, two lots like racing together. Um, I was fighting for outright wins, but the guy who was leading the points was in the lower championship, but you could still get all the points. Right, okay. Um, I wasn't fighting him directly, but I was fighting gotcha. for points. Yep. Martin and I were fighting each other and trading each of the points, and this guy was doing better because he had less opposition. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, but I needed to beat Martin, of course, each time. Anyway, obviously, we come to the final race of the year. It's 2003, we're at Snetterton, um, and I was a bit down because I thought, well, I, 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 my hopes of winning this championship are not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, this chap who was leading the points at the time, who was racing a Group C or D car, he said, uh, well, no, actually, he said, theoretically, you can still win it, but what has to happen is, because he did all the, all the calculations, right. he said, you have to win the race outright, you have to get the fastest lap, and I, this chap, Bruce, I think his name was, had to come fifth or worse. Right. Okay? And is if that... all those things combined together... It meant that I had a sufficient points to win. Right. Anyway, we got off on the race. There's nothing I could do about his situation. Now he's having his race yeah. further away from me because he's a lower powered car than mine. But he, yeah. he's having his own race. Mm -hmm. We go off. We have the race. I have a fantastic race against Martin and loads of other guys. I mean, there were 30 cars in the race, but mostly it was me and Martin. Mm -hmm. And I overtook him. We did the Bentley Straight, which is the back straight. This is the circuit. Almost so like the 200 one. now, yeah. it's, it's an amended version of the 200, but that was the only circuit then, we didn't have the big 300 circuit. Yeah. And the really good overtaking place was down the long straight, under the bridge, and under brakes, into the sharp left-hander. Yeah. If you got it right and he hadn't blocked as successfully as he might have done, yeah. you can get through. Anyway, on that last lap, I managed to get a really good toe, I managed to overtake him into the S's for the nice. lead, on the last lap, stayed well, ahead. It's not as tight as it is now, is it? No, that that's section, right. That section was a lot more flowy. That's right. Now it's a lot. It's left, stop, That's right, right. that's right. Yeah. You still had the stop going for the right before okay. you the bomb hole. Okay. Um, and anyway, I managed to get him on the last... Well, effectively, that's the last proper corner, isn't it? Other than Corum and then yeah. uh, on the back to start finish straight. Stayed ahead, 
won the, I knew I'd won the race. I didn't know whether I'd got the fastest, fastest lap. lap, of course, and I didn't know how the other bloke was doing. Yeah. But actually, um, people were saying that the um, commentators were going absolutely wild because A, I'd managed to get the overtake to take the win, yeah. and they knew I'd had the fastest lap because I had got the fastest lap. And on uh, this, this other chap, um, Bruce, he spun. He was something in something like fourth in his class. Yeah. He spun and finished something like seventh or eighth. Oh dear. Was that so, near the end of the race as well? Yeah, towards the end of the race. Jeez. So we came into the Park Ferme collecting area uh, area to all this jubilation of Pete, you've won the championship. Amazing. Which was amazing. By one point. By one point. Yeah. That's crazy. So uh, that was fantastic. So it was a great way to end the season. Yeah, that's pretty good. And story. to pick up the trophy. <laughs> that's very good. Yeah, so that was, was my awesome. first championship, 2003. Well, that's a good way to win your first championship. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. But yeah, very interesting there to learn about, well, a, your, big, your biggest crash and your first championship win there. That was amazing. But we'll call it half time there. We'll have a little break. But be sure to join us. Come back, we'll be chatting about my dad's further racing experience, his, t his time in sort of the factory championship and the European championship and everything like that, and the cars that he races nowadays, so don't go anywhere. to the Chatterbox Podcast with your host, Sir Meerkat. And again, joined today by my father, Mr. Papa Meerkat. Uh, no need for any further introductions, really. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the first half of the podcast and uh, hopefully you enjoy the second half as well. So you continued racing in 750 Motor Club until, sorry, um, in the factory championship. No, no, this was in 750, right. 2003 when I won. Now, the same championship 04 right and the same championship 05 gotcha. 04, okay and then 04 I was runner up 05 I won it again right okay okay yeah and then in 06 um I bought a um a different car and kept my 750 car I right. bought another car second hand car with the we'd gone to the Cosworth engines by then right uh, which was the 2 liter 210 horsepower with an H pattern six speed gearbox to do the European Championship. Mm -hmm. I'd sold my business in 2006. Um, there was a bit more money around, mm -hmm. so I was able to do both. So I did the 750 Championship okay. in the UK car and I did the Caterham European Championship in the other car. Yeah. Okay? As yeah. I went off, you were still only six or yeah. something at the time. So we couldn't do them all as a family. So I went off and flew abroad and the car got taken out. Wow. And I raced at all the big circuits. Yeah, I was going to ask where, in Europe, where did you race? Yeah, we raced, there was one UK circuit and that was Donington. Then all the others were abroad. We went to Spa, Hockenheim, Monza, Estoril, um, ba, 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 and Nürburgring. Yeah. And I think it was six events. Double headers, all of them, all the way around mainland Europe. Wow. Fantastic. That's Absolutely great fantastic. Cool experience, yeah. yeah, it was really, really good. Really competitive. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I was a mid pack runner, I guess, in that first season. And then at the end of that season, um, I decided to stop running the 750 Motor Club. Oh, and I won the championship in 750 Motor Club, that's yeah. right, 2006. So I'd won it three times. So 03, it was 05 sort of, and 06. It was sort of like you had the European one where it was like, okay, right, this one's bloody serious. Yeah. And 750 was like, turn up, hey boys, let's go racing sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. 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 The, UK, the European Championship, everybody had proper backing, yeah. full teams, like sponsors and stuff. proper sponsorship, all the rest of it. So yeah. it was expensive. And people were testing. I never did testing. Yeah. Because I, I couldn't have time. I was running the business. Yeah, you were doing businesses. So I couldn't do that. Yeah. Anyway, I had a lot of fun, um, and um, won the UK, and I thought, well, end of 06, 07, I want to do the UK Championship now, Caterham Championship, 
And I did that in 07, 08 and 09. In 2006 of the Euro one, was that when you raced against Paul O'Neill at Nürburgring? Yes, it was, yeah. yeah. it was. Can oh. you tell us the story of how you ended up racing against Paul O'Neill and mm. what happened there? If any of you don't know, Paul O'Neill is a guy that used to race in British touring cars. Now he's sort of a pundit, isn't he? I know yeah. he does British touring cars punditry. Right. I think he does some other stuff as well, but mm -hmm. I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah, what happened with that? Well, they had a guest driver at each race. Right, okay. And there'd be a factory backed car provided for the guest driver. Well, that's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. And he was out there, so, you know, he was an interesting character. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, nice and we were out racing and we found ourselves head to head with each other. I was battling for about sixth or something like that, fifth or sixth. Yeah. And on the final lap at Nürburgring, he tried a move on me that was... Audacious. Well, it was a bit firm. Yeah. Anyway, I resisted it and bumped back on him. Was, and there, was there any contact? Or? There might have been a touch, a just bit. a hint. But anyway, I wasn't going to take any nonsense. No, no. He As was, they say, if you ain't rubbing, you ain't racing. Well, you know, you try to avoid it in cadence because it can go very yeah, wrong. Yeah, the wheels are a bit too Yeah, because you are exposed. Yeah. But anyway, we had a really good dice uh, and I beat him. I think I was fifth and he was sixth. Nice. So I was very happy with that. So yeah, and then in, afterwards we were warmly chatting and having a laugh about it. That's and he cool. said to me, yeah, pretty firm rebuke there, Pete, sort of thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, I said, well, you know, couldn't let you through, could I? Um, exactly. And it was great. It's good. But he had, he, he, had, he had really enjoyed the race. He was doing, was he doing touring cars at the time? I, can't I think remember. so. Yeah. I think he might have. He was around that time. He did it for a long time. Yeah. In touring cars. Well, I guess because he was the guest driver, he was sort of like, well, I might as well send it here, sort of thing. And then thought, thought, thought maybe because he was the guest, the celebrity driver, yeah. that someone might go, oh, sorry, Paul, move out of the way. And you were like, no, that's not happening. Absolutely. I'm not letting you through here. No, absolutely. No, that's good. That's good. But it was good fun. Um, great race. Um, and then at the end of that year, thought, well, I'll start using that car for the UK Championship. Yeah. So we were now into 2007. I sold off the um, 750 Motor Club car and did the UK Championship, which is all the big circuits, you know, Donington, Silverstone, yep. Alton Park, etc, etc, etc. And I did that in seven. Would you say you preferred racing around Europe or around the UK tracks? Um, well, I always preferred having family with me and that uh, racing in Europe was more difficult as a family. So it was sort of more just having that one time experience yeah. just to do it once mm. and say you've done it. Absolutely. And, and that was a great experience. But the, um, um, so we wanted to go back and do the UK, which always included one European round as well. Okay. It was often at Spa, it might have been Nürburgring and what have you. Okay. Spa's fantastic. I'd raced there quite a few times um, in guest races and all sorts of stuff, um, which was always good. So doing the UK championship, so I did that in 07, um, 08, um, and 09. Just um, before we delve into later years of that, I wanted to ask you about something not to do with caterums, mm -hmm. which was, I think it was 2006 you were telling me, where you had quite a cool opportunity to race something that wasn't your caterum at a special event. Can you tell us what that was? Yeah, that was, I think it was 2006. Um, a mate of mine owned a Chevron B26 called Chocolate Drop. It's a very famous early 70s car. And he wanted to race it at Le Mans, at the classic Le Mans. Yep. And he got an entry, but he didn't want to do it on his own. And he rang me and said, would I mind sharing his B26 at Le Mans Classic? Well, of it's course, you good, think about that a for a, a nanosecond yeah. and say, yes, please. <laughs> With no thought whatsoever, because I've never driven a car like that. I've never driven a car which is, which is downforce slicks. Oh wings, yeah, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. The whole All bit. The and it's a 70s delicate race car. And I've never driven a car like that. Mm -hmm. So it's something very, very different. But I thought, well, what the hell? You know, this is an opportunity. Fantastic. And uh, um, we went and did a test at Silverstone. Um, there was something wrong with the um, uh, rev counter. And he told me not to over rev it, but I didn't know what the revs were. So I was like, listen, this thing revs to 10,000. But if it revs it to 10, two, it goes bang. So really, really, anyway, we do a test at Silverstone on the national circuit and I was pretty close to his time and he raced this car quite a bit. And I thought, actually, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe yeah. I can do it. So I said, yeah, fantastic. We're on for that. We're all geared up to go to uh, Le Mans for the classic. And uh, about um, three weeks before the event, 
he was out doing a test in the car on his own. Something went wrong with the engine uh, and an exhaust valve blew. He couldn't get a spare exhaust valve and he had to scrub the entry. Oh, really, so really sad. So we never went. That's so annoying. Very annoying. And he, di he didn't call you up the next year then? No. Oh. Um, sadly, he became very ill. Oh, he subsequently died, oh. uh, which was really, really sad. Yeah. Uh, but no, he became ill about a year later. The Le Mans event is biannually. He ah, couldn't okay. do it the 2008. Sense, the opportunity had gone. Then I think he, he became ill. Yeah. Um, and he died some years later, but the car got sold and that was the last opportunity. Mm. Yeah, that's sad. Well, it was cool to have the opportunity at least to drive it yeah. once or twice, but yeah. racing would have been cool. But that's a yeah. famous car. And it's, it's, uh, you, know, yeah. you see it around occasionally now. Yeah, that's cool. What's, what's that car sort of worth now? Oh, Shop I would drop. think um, 200,000 probably. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, like that. yeah, that would be... Uh, Interesting one to be behind the wheel of. Yeah, yeah, certainly. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, after that happened, you moved from the Euro Championship of the KOMs to yeah. the, the British UK Factory, Factory Championship. Championship. Yeah, that's right. UK Factory Championship. So that racing was, a car it was called the C400. Yeah, so that's so a 210 from, horsepower. So you've gone from engine. the R400 to the C4. What's yes. the difference? It's different engines. Right, R400 okay. was the Rover engine, 1800 okay. horse, 1800 cc, 200 horsepower. Mm -hmm. And we're now in the C400, which is the Cosworth engine, eight, uh, oh, two so litre. R just means Rover and C means Cosworth. Oh, right, okay. yeah. So we've got a two litre Ford Cosworth based engine, mm -hmm. 210 horsepower, running a six speed. Initially, it was a six speed manual H pattern box, and then latterly it became a sequential box. Right. Okay, but in the early days we were racing these things flat shifting in an H pattern box, and you destroy the gearbox. And I was having to rebuild gearboxes every other meeting. Jesus. So I had two gearboxes and we're rebuilding them between races because so you just destroy them. Yeah. You know, flat shifting is where you don't lift the accelerator. Yeah, yeah. You just dip the clutch, ram it into the next gear and keep your foot flat pinned. <laughs> Jesus. And, the, and it's, pr it's brutal on yeah, the tracks. I can imagine. But it does save probably half a second a lap or something like Worth that. <laughs> Not so good when you're paying the bills. Yeah, exactly. So you raced in that 2006, 2009? Yeah, so? 2009 was, was the final year of that. Numbers were starting to fall away. Well, were um, there any sort of, in those years that you raced in, were there any like standout moments of battles or crashes? Or uh, Well, there was some huge competition. It was just fantastic racing. Was there anyone like particularly famous? Um, no, like, not well as such. Not really. It's all a good variety of people. I was an older racer. We do get quite a lot of younger guys coming in, do it for a year and then go off and do other things. Yeah, moving through sort of Gillettas, yeah, quite a lot of that. F3. Absolutely. Dan Dennis was a good illustration of that. Yeah, um, he was a young guy, very capable, 18, 19 year old racer, did very, very well, had lots of support from his dad. Yeah. And I had some great d dices against him. I think he was on the dark blue coals, wasn't he? Yes, he was, yeah. that's right. I yeah. remember. I remember. had some great dices, but we'd always have fantastic races. They were all so close. They're all on the telly. Yeah. Uh, we got been cool. great, great videos, you know, of races where you'd win a 30 minute race, you know, and it was a fraction of a second yeah, every that's time. Crazy. If I well, can find any like old clip stuff on YouTube, I'll pop them in the description, by the way, if anyone wants to have a look at them. Right, yeah. No, there was some great racing, really, really good. Yeah. And then 09 was the big year for me, um, uh, in that I came runner up in that championship. Dan right. won it right. uh, by a few points, sadly, but I thought, right, 2010 is going to be awesome. I'm going to win. Mm -hmm. Um, sadly, they uh, scrapped R400 because oh. by then there were insufficient numbers. I remember that whole situation happening because yeah. it sort of ruined you on the money front, didn't it? Well, like, it was really you bad. Then suddenly had a car that didn't really. Well, the problem was anymore. that um, they brought out a car called the R300, oh, yeah, a lower yeah. powered car That's that was going to be less expensive to run. Right. Uh, we'd gone through the financial crisis of 08, 09. Yeah. Uh, they wanted to try and make it more affordable. We were all spending a lot of money on these cars and going racing. Yeah. They brought out this cheaper car with this um, uh, factory stock Ford engine, lower powered, and it was supposed to be less expensive to run. People started buying those cars and those numbers were climbing. Yep. So there were fewer R400, C400 cars and those numbers were declining. Right. Uh, and they were run as two separate setups, you know. But anyway, um, I thought 2010 is going to be great. Unfortunately, they made a last-minute decision to can 
the C400 Championship uh, to concentrate on the, um, I think they called it the R300 then. Right. So there was nowhere to go. I couldn't get an R300 because they had all been sold. My C400 had no home. So the logical place to go was into Classic Sports Car Club, who had started to pr promote a seven series called Magnificent Sevens. Yeah. And also, money-wise, um, it was a lot less expensive. Yeah. You didn't have to go away for the whole weekend, the way you did the factory championship. You were away often for three or four days. Yeah, wow. With this one, it was a one-day meeting, and it was easier to do with yeah. family life and business life and all the rest of mm -hmm. it. Um, so I was able to take that car and utilise it in the CSCC Magnificent Sevens. So I did that in 2010 for my first season in that. And then you just stayed in Magnificent Sevens from 2010? Well, I had the first so. the, fir the first incident there was uh, uh, a little bit of an unfortunate <laughs> incident in that the first race was at Snetterton, and uh, uh, my car was not a top-grade car. Let me do that. I think that right now is... No, that was a different different thing. We'd built another car by then. I think I'd sold that car. I think I must have sold the C400. Right. Um, and yeah. um, I can't remember now what we did thinking about that. Anyway, no matter. Um, but um, I, did, I think I did race that car for that season and then decided to do something else in that. We created another car. We, put, we built a, um, a more competitive engine. Uh, we got this Cosworth engine that um, Luke built for me and it was designed to go in the uh, second grade because they had a power rating arrangement um, up to 260 brake, there was like up to 150, 210, 260 and then beyond. So you um, want it on the top? I, the well I wanted to be order. hopefully in the um, in the second class as it were in terms of power yeah, but fighting for wins, I mean, yeah. fighting for wins against the guys who've got the more powerful cars. Yeah. That's what we're aiming to do, and and I did do that for for a while. I had a lot of fun, nice. and did all sorts of races, and would win some and not win others, and mm -hmm. what have you. Um, through, um, I suppose that was you know twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and yeah. the like. So through those years in CSCC, what check? Because I know you've had a few you had a few caterings yeah. at that time. Mm. What can you talk us through, like the different caterings you had? Any standout things you remember from those championships? Well, they, I mean, the, the first good car that um, uh, Luke bought, built for me was in 2013. He built me a brand new car with this 280 horsepower engine, just under 280 horsepower engine. Yep. And I went on, and in 14, I was never off the podium. Wow. I had a lot of wins. Uh, we had huge numbers of cars competing. Um, and I won the championship 2014, so that was absolutely Good. amazing. Yeah. Um, 15, uh, I'm trying to think when we created the CSR, that was a bit later. Um, I think we put a bigger engine in that one. I'm pretty sure that it was pushing, yeah, about, about 280 brake. It was 260 initially, then we put a 280 brake engine in it. Um, we got a sequential gearbox. Um, fantastic car, very, very good fun, yeah. reliable. And then um, uh, we sold that and built the CSR, which is the wider, no we didn't, I beg your pardon, I, ke I kept racing that, but I, uh, in 2016, uh, when I was 60, do you remember I did the whole championship, the idea was on my birthday, which happened to be October the 15th, 2016, I needed to win the race at Alton Park, and retire from catering racing because I was going to be racing the Lister in 2017. Right. Okay. That was the plan. Yeah. I didn't win that race, uh, but I did win the championship. Well, the, it was called a series, not a championship. Yeah. And I then announced, right, that's it. I'm not racing caterings anymore because next year I'm going to be racing the Lister because mm -hmm. we, we'd ordered to build a new recreation, yeah. continuation Lister. Talk about that, yeah, after the catering racing. Yeah. And that and we'd ordered that in January 2015. The idea, it was going to take two years to get built, and I was going to race it from 2017 yeah. it, with Motor Racing Legends in the Sterling Moss Trophy, yeah. which is a race for pre-61 sports race cars. So there'd be all sorts of Listers, Maseratis, Lotus, yeah. Cooper Monaco's, all those cars like that. Yeah. But unfortunately, there was a lot of delays in getting the car built. It didn't arrive in 17. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wasn't really doing any racing because I'd said I wasn't doing it. We still got the car. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I thought, well, never mind. We'll race it in 18. Yeah. So you just had a year off. It's, yeah. It still didn't arrive. I'd sold the car, the cold caterham. It still yeah. didn't arrive in even the beginning of 18. And so I bought the CSR off Simon Smith. Do you remember? Yes, I remember. I'd raced against him numerous times. Yeah. Um, him in his CSR, me in my red narrow-bodied car. Yeah. We'd had great dices, but he'd got a 320 horsepower engine in that thing. A bit heavier than my narrow-bodied car. Yeah. Um, so I bought that right at the beginning of 18 to say, right, if I've got to wait for the Lister even longer, I'll buy that and I'll go racing. And I raced right. that throughout 18. Yep. It was absolutely fantastic, and I did have lots of fun in that yeah, against Gary and Simon and uh, all those lads. Great, yeah. great fun. And again, there was quite a lot on telly, wasn't there? There was some good stuff at Thruxton. What yeah. Had some great racing. Came to the end of 18. Beginning of 19, the Lister did arrive. And so 19 was to do the full season in the Lister, racing yeah. around all of the big places, including Spa for the six hours weekend. Yeah. Silverstone for the Silverstone Classic, Donington, the Donington Classic, Thruxton, the historic meeting, yeah. and then Portimao uh, in Portugal. Yeah. Big, yeah. big, big events. And we raced that car um, yeah. throughout 19. Well, we'll, talk, we'll talk more about the, uh, the Nobly in a second. Okay. But, but just finishing off the cage of racing, so you finished that in 2018 then. Yeah. What would you say, because you've done sort of more... I don't know. I don't know what the word but to use like professional championship of like the factory stuff, mm -hmm. and you also done more sort of relaxed yeah. club stuff. What would you say you prefer out of those two? <laughs> well, I like one mate racing where you've got all the cars are the same. Yeah, those are the things for me. Where you've got a whole load of cars that, at least in theory, are exactly the same. It's all about the man behind the wheel. Yeah, and the prep and all getting it right. Mm -hmm. That's what I really used to enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of these races now are uh, you can buy success by buying bigger and bigger engines and yeah, the like and I'm not very really fond of that. I'd much rather yeah. have everybody saying, right, doesn't matter what speed they are, you know, even if they're all relatively low powered yeah, cars. Ones, so. well, I'd, I've never done that, so I don't really know about that. But like caterums, you know, if you get a 130 horsepower car or a 200 horsepower car or 250 horsepower car, yeah. if they're all pretty much the same, you can have fantastic racing. But if you've got a guy that's just got a massive wallet and he's going off and buying success, yeah, it's not, well, what's the point of that? It's not really as fun as it. No, so yeah. uh, I like the fact that it's one make and, it, and it's pretty equal. Yeah, but between, so you finished KTM Racing. Yeah. Between the KTM Racing and the, so it was sort of a bit of an overlap between the KTM Racing yes. and then you had the list after, but you had an overlap with when you were racing another car. Yes. Which was your Ford Capri. Because the it? Capri, yeah, well that came out back in 2013. So, uh, well there's, there's definitely, I know there's videos of this on YouTube on the Goodwood Members Meeting page of my highlights and stuff, so yeah. that will definitely be in the description that you can yeah. have a look at, but yeah. yeah. What happened with getting the Capri? In? 2013. Why I, did you choose, why did you get? <laughs> well I'd always, I wanted to go classic racing in some shape or form. Mm -hmm. And 2013 I was at the... Uh, As you became a classic yourself, you wanted <laughs> to start racing classics. <laughs> Well, I've done a lot of catering racing, you know. Yeah. Um, I've had something like 140 podiums. Bloody hell. Including 76 wins. Wow. And uh, four championships over Not about 18, 18 or 19 years. Yeah. Wow. So I've had a lot of fun. I've had a reasonable amount of success. It's been fantastic. Yeah. But actually, it's quite nice to think, well, I might do something else. Mm. Switch up. Yeah. Um, I was at the Festival of Speed with my mate Howard in 2013. He'd owned a Capri for years and it was sat doing nothing in his garage. Mm -hmm. I said to him, Howard, why don't you sell me that car? Why don't you sell me that car? Yeah. He didn't want to sell it. In the end, we struck a deal where I bought half of it and we would go racing together. Yeah. So whilst I was still doing all my catering racing, we got this car going. We ran it together in the CSCC. 40-minute mm -hmm. two-driver races in the Future Classic it's series. That you were doing... Because it's obviously CSCC as well, so you were doing the K2 racing and the Ford Capri racing on the same weekend. Yes. That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. But we shared that. Yeah, and it was good. It. it was great fun. It was very DIY. We had a mate helping us do the mechanicals. Yeah, I Howard and I would do what was necessary. We weren't very good at that sort of thing, but yeah. we would do it. And yet I would have the catering fully professionally done by Luke and the team, yeah. Team Leo's. Uh, and that was my serious racing. The Capri was just a lot of fun with a couple of mates, really. But it got more interesting and more exciting. We blew it up at Spa big time, and we thought, actually, we ought to do this job properly. 
So we thought, because it's got great history, this car, so we thought we'll invest in it big time and try and turn it into a Goodwood members meeting car. Yeah. So we invested a lot of money into it, had it completely rebuilt, and Skid rebuilt the engine for us. Mm -hmm. Skid was already racing his car. He got a white Capri. Our Capri had been white as well, but we turned it back into what it was originally, which was yellow with the blue, in the track marshal kind of full livery. circle there from banana man to begin with and yeah absolutely, and banana man again. As well. absolutely absolutely so back to that so we've spent a lot of money on the car we did get an entry we oh somebody at the door um but we got an entry to uh, we'd already we, we we'd given a share of the car to skid for him to do all the mechanical work and what have you so then the three of us owned it yep. we got an entry to goodwood to the members meeting and skid and i shared the racing and we've raced it at Goodwood, um, I think, three times. And I've, he and I have raced it in numerous other events in the Tony Dron Trophy. Yep. So, which is it's a Group 1 car, has to race on Group 1 uh, historic tyres. has to be totally period correct. And we've raced that over the years and had a lot of fun with it, including last year's members meeting where we had a good result. Yep. And this year we were planning, we were going to go in March to the members meeting. Sadly, that's all been curtailed with COVID. And yeah, yeah. Waiting for it this year. Yeah, it's been a bit frustrating. But uh, <laughs> a lot. Yeah. So you had that. You've sort of. You so you you've still got the Capri, haven't you? Yes. Still wanting still to race that. that. Yep. In the future with uh, the Howard and Skid and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Then you also, as you said, you touched on earlier. You picked up this list of Jaguar Nobly. Yes. You like what? You, most people, I, I'm assuming most people are like that. I'm going to have a clue what that even clue. is. And neither so. did I have a clue. But what happened was, I'm a member of Bentley Drivers Club, uh, and Bentley Drivers Club organise events and gatherings and the like to um, places. I got a ticket to go for a tour of the Lister factory in Cambridge. I didn't really know a lot about these cars. I'd heard that people were looking to get these cars built again uh, i went along and i met the guy who'd bought the business a very wealthy guy he bought the business and he wanted to get lister back into production um anyway he bought the whole thing he'd set up contracts to build these cars and they were going to create 10 only of these cars called a jaguar lister nobly okay um yeah. i mean a, a real pay period like lister nobly could be worth millions Okay. And people race them. And people race them. <laughs> so they're completely insane. unobtainable for most normal folk. Yeah. But a, a continuation car, which is factory correct in every respect, built by the factory to everything exactly as it was in period, yeah. comes with FIA paperwork, everything there, mm -hmm. and it's got the Jaguar 3.8 engine, straight six, triple Webers, nice. wide angle head, open pipes pushing 350 horsepower yeah, well, through a four speed the, d type gearbox from the footage it's so loud yes i'll ho again hopefully try and put some in the description but it's so loud that thing yeah, it's unbelievable yeah so on hell of a tool of a thing mm -hmm. anyway um uh, they are still a lot of money uh but not as much as a multi-million pound yeah. one yeah uh, and it gives you access to all the same races because it's got mm -hmm. fia paperwork so we thought, well, this would be a really nice thing to do. So we ordered it back in 2015. Mm -hmm. I was getting number 10 of 10. So I was in a bit of a waiting list. Right. Due to happen by 17, massive delays, got it at the beginning of 19. And once you've got a new built car, you then have to turn it into a race car. And you have to race right. prepare it. And that means you've got to alter things. Costs. It costs a lot of money. Jeez. I had a pro pro professional working with me, Sam Hancock. So, some, so, they, were, so they were building them for road? Basically. They were, but they're all built to the well, same spec, and then you have to effectively well, make them proper race cars. So did you know, like, well, most of the people buying them to buy them to race, or were there were quite a few no, people that bought variety. them? No, variety. A lot so of them fair enough. I assume they was all for racing. I thought no, they came race ready. About four or five of them have become race cars, okay. and the others have become road cars. Oh, okay. I don't, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen one on the road. They, well, you don't. But yeah. You don't. They go into yeah. people's collections around the world. Yeah, I guess. It's a bit boring, isn't it? Mm. Much prefer to race it. Well, the racing it is great. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, so we spent the beginning of 19 doing track development work um, and getting it all 100% ready for the first outing, uh, which was, well, I did a, I did a pre-race meeting with the 50 sports cars at Donny because yeah. I couldn't do the test. I've got business commitments. Yeah. And then the first thing was the Donington Classic. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I shared the car with Luke 
um, and we finished eighth, I think, on that uh, event, yes. um, and then went on and did the Silverson Classic, did the Thruxton Historic, and the Spa Six Hours Weekend, and um, I finished that year. I didn't get any. I got one podium, second at Thruxton. Nice. Uh, and I finished. I can't remember what number in the overall championship, but the car won the Brian Lister Cup, which was for the most successful Lister in the Sterling Moss Trophy, uh, other, other, other than a Lister that won it, because a Lister ah. won that championship. Okay. So, uh, so that was quite good for its first year, and then we were getting everything ready for this year to do the full championship this year. Uh, and then lockdown, and mm, we haven't, didn't been happen. Able to, haven't been able to race. Yeah, well, hopefully, 2021. Yeah, all of that will start to. Well, we did have the opportunity to to race it at Thruxton a couple of weeks ago, and there's the big event at Spa in September, which is yep. the Spa Six Hours Weekend. Yeah, we decided earlier in the summer that we'd not race it at all because it's not a full championship. Mm -hmm. So we're going to save the budget, and save the car, so that next year we do the whole thing gotcha. and hopefully do well. Gotcha. That's yeah, the plan. Cool. I look forward to, to seeing that. Hopefully, I can come to come some of the races. Absolutely, yeah. Should be good. Right. Um, I want to, a couple of people asked like similar questions online, but I had questions to ask as well already written down. What is firstly your favourite track in the UK? Secondly, your favourite track across all of Europe, across like everywhere. Oh no, debate. Donington. Okay. Is my favourite in the UK. Yeah. And Spa. Yeah. Good choices. Yeah. Very good choices. I'm guessing that's your favourite on the F1 calendar then. Um, Smart. Yes, I think it probably is. Yeah. 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 Nice. That's cool. So we'll move on to the fan questions. I asked on Instagram and Twitter. It's actually all Instagram today, so Twitter. You need to up your game, lads. Come on, get some good questions in for the next podcast. Um, so yeah, I asked people. Uh, it, it, I have a father who has done motor racing in the past. What questions do you want to ask him? I mean, Decent amount of people asking some questions, so I've taken four, I believe, for you to answer today. So I'll jump straight into them. Okay. If you're ready. Yep. Um, at Thomas288, he asked, What track would you like to see on the F1 calendar that's no longer available slash closed? Oh, wow. So I already know what my pick for this would be. The Valencia Street Circuit in Spain that's now abandoned. <laughs> Right. would be incredible to be back on the calendar because they literally had, I'm pretty sure it only had one race in 2012 I think where Fernando Alonso had his, because the car, the Ferrari car for that year was awful and uh, he had that amazing win around the street circuit I think if I remember correctly it was only on that year then it got dropped because Barcelona government didn't have enough um, sorry Valencia where's that? Spain yeah, I know it's in Spain, there's nowhere near Barcelona, there was a, not Catalonia, somewhere in Spain anyway, they didn't have enough money okay. to get it back on the calendar, and it's all still abandoned now, anyway. it's had loads of looting, arson, anyway. it's got the pictures of it online are so cool, anyway. but yeah, anyway. I don't know what you'd think, maybe, I don't know, Hockenheim, Old well, Hockenheim, Old no. Monza? No, Aintree. Aintree, that's a good one. Yeah, Aintree. That's a very good one. Because in the 50s, of course, that was a very popular... Yeah, I covered that in my top five abandoned UK racetracks yeah. video. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's, a good, that's a good track, that. Yeah. Oh, did you ever go there yourself no. to watch it? No, never been. It was all closed before. No. Because no. they still have partially open, like the national bit is still open for sprints, yes. but the international bit's all abandoned and closed. I think that's right. Yeah. Shut off. Yeah, yeah, that is correct. Good answer. Um, at Mayard Hermia, apologies, I've completely mispronounced your name there. They asked, who do you believe is the greatest Formula One driver of all time? <laughs> What's your thought? We're thinking Schumacher, Hamilton, Senna, well, they're, they're, those questions can never really be answered, can they? Because yeah, different eras. You always, you always got to have. A, oh yeah, but he was like the what? Like to me, he was he was just that. Wow. There are so many people that you could say that, but actually, Dick Seaman is probably <laughs> one of nice. the best. He's the one with the best name as well. He's got a great jo name. Funny that you should say that, Josh um, Revel. Just on a small channel, you might not know him, he's got 100,000 subscribers, he's quite a big channel. Um, he just did a video about Dick Seaman. Really? Talking about how amazing he was and, yeah. and this and this and he that. He was incredible. So, he was incredible. Yeah. And also racing, pre-war, racing for Mercedes and for the German government. He talked all about that, yeah. Just incredible, absolutely incredible. 
Um, no, you know, re really, really amazing. But then, you know, you look at the guys from the 60s, you know, racing in that really, really difficult time. And then, of course, people like Jackie Stewart, you know, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Jackie Stewart's not everybody's, you know, cup of tea. But, you know, Graham Hill, you know, these amazing characters and what have you. Yeah. Um, but well, surely, uh, yeah, I was okay of that time. Sorry, I was no. You carry on. You carry on. I was getting confused. But the mod, the more modern ones, I don't really have so much of a view. I mean, you have yeah. to say, there's no doubt about it, that Hamilton is the standout mile, isn't he? But yeah. you know, he's got people coming up on him now. People like Leclerc and what have you are going to be sensational. Yes, absolutely sensational. But at the moment, it's hard to say there's anything as good Pe as Hamilton. people are going to be annoyed with you there that you said Leclerc, not Verstappen. Well, Verstappen's also phenomenal, but he's a wee bit ahead of Leclerc, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah, you know, he's people, gonna, people are gonna like. He's that, already that. batting hard. Yeah. Again, whereas these others are coming from behind, aren't they? Leclerc's doing yeah. well in a substandard car. Yeah. Whereas Verstappen is in a pretty good car. Mm -hmm. None of them are anything like as good a car as the as the Mercedes. No. But uh, exactly. Um, well. So, any particular one you would have picked there, Jackie Stewart, maybe? Mm. Or leave it open. No, I think I'd leave it open. Don't want to say. Don't want to say. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Sorry, Mayard, he doesn't want to answer your question. <laughs> so there you go. Um, at important noon nine, they asked, "What is your favourite memory?" pre-race, so like sat in the collecting area or whatnot. I put that in just because I found it funny because what's your favourite memory pre-race? Usually you're absolutely shitting it pre-race. Yes, absolutely. So I guess you don't really have any favourite no. memories from before a race because you're always just like, oh my god, yeah. I'm about to race. Yeah, well because I, I rarely eat on race day, yeah. I go to the loo a lot, <laughs> I'm absolutely getting myself into the zone, I want to be the best that I can possibly be. Mm -hmm. And so it's all those uh, trying to control the nerves. Um, we could do um, um, James Hunt, just throw up over the side and then yeah, jump in. I've never done that. Uh, maybe I'm not as competitive as him. But um, Maybe you just weren't smoking enough cigarettes. Well, I, no, I didn't smoke cigarettes. <laughs> um, so I didn't really have a lot of thoughts. I was always thinking about the end game. Mm -hmm. I'd always be thinking about my tactics. Are I you... always had a start procedure. Right. Absolute start procedure, and I was religious with this as to how I would arrive at the um, my, my my box. Yep. Okay. You're obviously waiting for everybody to queue because hopefully you're really close to the front of the yeah. of the grid. I'd be in gear with the clutch down. I would pull the clutch up to just onto the biting point, and then I would put it down a fraction, fraction more. Yeah. Yep. I would bring the revs up to my start, and that was always around about four two. Yeah, well, this is because as he's talking through the starting procedure in F one, you have like the six red lights come on individually. You wait, and then they go out. With club racing, usually it's just red lights come on, red lights, red go, lights go off. So you have a lot less time. You to, do. You, so you're doing this all before yeah. it's even. So I always have started. a very strong sequence of events that I followed religiously, and I was generally a pretty good starter. If I was starting 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th or something, mm -hmm. I could often make up a space or two. I'm just the same in Garden. Well, and then it's, it's a good way because it's, you know, if you can make a space or two in the first go, that's that's a lot of battling done, I'm isn't it? I'm the Lance Stroll of karting, qualifying terribly and then just jumping up. Yes, my qualifying's never been my strongest point. I race a lot better than I qualify. Yeah. Uh, I really, really do. But this whole starting sequence of making sure that you've got balanced throttle at your whatever revs you want so 4-2 holding it no blipping hold it at the revs which you know is the right um, revs to get the car off the line and obviously if it's wet you slightly less yep. around about 4200 is usually about right for the catering kind of start right bike point and then just a fraction dip down you're holding there lights come on revs are steady and you never take your eyes off the lights yep. and as soon Don't as they're out you're off yeah Minimal wheel spin, maximum traction away, and trying to get, trying to get Traction. through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. It, absolutely crucial because lots of people don't have a sequence for starting, no. and they'll be revving it like no. that. Absolutely wrong. No. Or they take their eye off, or they look no. at something else, or they haven't got it in gear properly, or they're not properly in their box, or any number of things. You got to have a sequence. Yeah. So I'd always be thinking that. But the pre-race thing. You know, in the collecting area, you're notionally chatting to all the other guys before you're getting in the car. Yeah. 
But really, you just you have a pretty, pretty much trying to get in their head. You're playing some mind games. There's always a little bit of that. Yeah. But basically, you're crapping yourself about getting off the start <laughs> line and not cocking it up, yeah. wanting to get on with the race. Nice, so. nice. Uh, but move on to the final question from uh, from you guys out there at underscore jg underscore two four two. They said, "Who was the best driver that you've ever raced against?" Now we talk about Paul O'Neill at Nurburgring already. Yeah. Someone else that I wanted to talk about was you raced quite recently in the Lister Jaguar yes. against Mr. Tiff Nidell. I did, yeah. Who was another BTCC racing driver? Yes. Would you say that he's one of the best that you raced against? Or? Well, he's acknowledged as a seasoned pro, isn't he? Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say he was any better than anybody else in that race, particularly yeah. of the front runners. Or you I beat mean. him? I did beat him. Yes, well, I did you. beat him. But the guy he shared that car with, John Spires, he's a very successful historic racer yeah. in a car that's identical to mine. Mm -hmm. I did slightly better than them at Thruxton. I managed to beat John and Tiffany Dell in yeah. that race. I came second. I was racing on my own. It was a one-hour, two-driver race. But one. I did it on my own. I managed to get slightly ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always felt good about that. It's nice to be able to beat Tiffany Dell. Yeah, uh, cool. So, yeah, I was pretty pleased with that. But who would you say was the best then? You raced against. Was there any one particularly? Was it the guy in the K two M series where you were racing nip and tuck that the whole time? Was he who you'd say is the best um, driver that you raced against? The most measured, like the best battle sort of thing. Well, I could always, I could always trust Martin mm. to not do something stupid. Not run you up against the pit wall. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he was really close, really competitive, but he was very professional. Um, room, yeah. And I met numerous guys in my catering racing over many, many years. I had great respect for them. You know, these are just club guys like me, and they're all paying their own bills just like me. People exactly. don't want to get smashed up in, you know, have yeah. a big, big expense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I had great respect for a lot of these guys. And you would go absolute head to head. And when you're doing a 120, 130 miles an hour, I mean, at Spa, my last CSR, we had it on the data at 156 going up the Cumhall Strait at Spa. That's pretty quick. Yeah. Especially when you're like this far off the ground. Well, you're that far <laughs> off the ground and you're that far off each other's wheels yeah. and you're going into Lake Com at the top. Oh 156. God. It's, you know, it's pretty, pretty steamy stuff. But oh. uh, um, Graham Tilly was a guy I always loved racing against. Yeah. Uh, very fair. He'd raced Formula Fords in the 70s and mm -hmm. come back into racing Caterhams in his later life. He now races in GTs, I think. Yeah, because he did Genetics for a bit. He did Genetics yeah, for a little while. On the he's... BTCC sort of circus. That's and right. now he's doing British GT. He is, that's racing, right. Isn't he? Yeah. A lot of money. Right? A lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but he was always a good guy to race against. I could always feel confident that, you know, head to head, we're not going to smash into each other. We've yeah. got respect. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's been quite a lot of guys uh, like that over the Jonathan Mitchell. Lovely oh, yeah. guy to race Caterhams again. He's now racing Chevrons and doing very well. Mm -hmm. But he, I always had a lot of respect for him. He was really on it, but you know he wouldn't do anything stupid. Yeah. Because exactly. you, you, you've got to trust each other yeah, when you're going head to head, side to side. That's the thing, especially in like the sim racing that I do. So I do. I've got my championship on the channel, the Moto Mika World Series, which will be well past done now. It's this weekend as we're recording. So, and this goes going out in like four weeks. And then I also do some sim racing where I actually race as well as the difficulty with sim racing there's a lot less respect i feel like there's yeah. more respect when you're on track in real life because you're like shit there's actually like possibility of crashing here like really hurting myself so Absolutely. you give that respect a lot more Absolutely. as on the sim so many people are just have no respect at all mm -hmm. will just bump you and push you around and this and this and that but so that's why when you do end up getting it's usually near the front of the grid um the people who will give you the room, will give you the space, will mm. actually jostle for position rather than just bumping and barging. Absolutely. It's you can't bump fun. and barge it's in real racing. Fun. No. You can't do that. Well, Especially in open wheel type. Yeah, I was going to say, unless you're closed wheel, BTCC yeah. type yeah. thing. But, but then it gets expensive because you've got to repair the cars. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, most people haven't got unlimited funds because they don't have sponsorship. Yeah. Precisely. But yeah, no, that's cool. Finally, after your thank you for all those fan questions, yeah. my final question to end off the interview would be if there are any sort of budding racing drivers out there, whether they're wanting to go on to say Formula One or whether they're just wanting to do fun club racing and have a laugh. Mm. What is there any one particular piece of advice that you'd want to yeah. give them? Yeah, there is. My my uh, my advice is if you think you've got a prospect of becoming a Lewis Hamilton and you've got the financial backing to do that, great, go for it. But 
that's very, very, very unlikely in most cases. It's a bit like professional football, isn't it? Millions of people want to play football, yeah. but there's only a few at the top of the game that make, you know, 200 grand a week or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Formula One's the same. There's only 22 people doing it, isn't there? But there are thousands of people who want to go racing. Oh, yeah. My advice would be, unless there is an absolute possibility of you getting to the top of the game in racing, don't bother with that. Get yourself a good job, make money, and go club racing at your own expense. Yeah. Perhaps possibly in later life. Yeah? Gotcha. So create some money and spend money in club racing. Club racing is fantastic fun, and you haven't got that competitive element of trying to become a Formula One driver, because there are dozens and dozens and dozens of poor race drivers. They haven't gone about doing their schoolwork, their uni work, and getting a job. Yeah. They haven't got any money, so they make money by being race instructors, and they're it's destined like for the a guy, life of no money. It's just like the guy on I, obviously, as you guys would know, do the BUKC, the British University Scouting Championship, and they've got a guy called Nicky Richardson, who is the um, sort of test driver of the carts, does loads of tuition and stuff like that. He was, Lewis Hamilton did an interview when he won the championship in like 20... 17 or something, I think, 2018. Um, and he said, he was talking about karting, and he was saying how his Nicky Richardson was the best in the championship he was in, or a little bit higher up, maybe. I think they were different, a bit different in age. And his dad would go and stand where Nicky was breaking and tell Lewis to break there. Mm -hmm. So Lewis has obviously become this multi millionaire winning world championships. Nicky's teaching people how to kart down yeah. at Wilton Mill. Yeah. So he's completely sort of mm. what he didn't he didn't get lucky, he didn't find the funds, he didn't That's right. even though he was bloody good and he yeah. still is amazingly literally when I'm out on track with him, he goes flying past and just leaves everyone in the dust. He's amazing to watch. But yeah, as you were saying, like he's had all that time that he could have been doing doing school, getting a job, getting qualifications that he's we went fair play to him trying to get this goal that he wanted so yeah, badly. Yeah. It didn't happen. Yeah. And now he's sort of not languishing. I'm sure he's having a great time doing it, but mm -hmm. it's not quite where he Indeed. wanted to be. So your advice would be to, Absolutely. unless you really yeah. think and hope If you've got a Hamilton can... dad with the amount of determination that they have, yeah. which is pretty exceptional because they didn't have the money. No, they um, didn't have But they got kids. a lucky break with McLaren, didn't they? they Ron did. Dennis and all the rest of it. Yes. Um, and it's a fairy tale story. But how many thousands of people don't make the fairy tale yeah, exactly. and they're less lives with not a lot of money. You don't make money in the world of cars and racing and all the rest of it. You really don't. No. It's um, a very you need money to go racing. Like that. Yeah, you need money to go racing. So why not, you know, concentrate on getting a good job or creating your own business or whatever exactly. and then go race because there's so much variety of club racing you can do mm -hmm. uh, at whatever age you know I mean I, I'm still racing I want to carry on racing for years if I can yeah. and I want to be competitive you know we all have that age we want to be competitive um, okay the older you get the less fit you get and all the rest of it are issues but mm -hmm. but you need the money and um, if you can create the money and then go racing that's often a better way to go than thinking you're going to be a you know, Lewis Hamilton. Probably more realistic as well, for most of us anyway. Sadly, I fear that's true, yeah. yeah. But still, there you have it. That has been my interview with my brilliant dad. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming Papa on. Meerkat. Papa Meerkat. My new name. Yeah, everyone's going to know you by that now. Mama and Papa Meerkat. <laughs> He's been on the podcast. Thank you for being on, Dad. It was great to sort of chat with you, getting to know your racing career, how you got into it. Hopefully, you guys all found it very interesting as well so did you did you enjoy yourself i did i had good. a great time yeah of course it's brought back some memories you yeah. i haven't written this down anyway you're re relying on everything and of course you think back you think oh, that's not quite what happened there something else happened and you yeah. missed things out so sorry i haven't done any prep for this so i'm sure i'll that's uh, fine that's what we wanted 100 but... we wanted just a nice relaxed chat yeah yeah, yeah no so that's great it's good i'm glad you enjoyed it but yeah as i said i hope you all enjoyed it as well if you did be sure to drop a like on it if you're watching on YouTube and subscribe to my channel down below, clicking that, red, that big red button even, I would really appreciate that. If you're listening to it on Spotify, be sure to follow the podcast. If you go onto the, pop onto the podcast page, click the little follow button, that'd be great. And if you're watching on Apple Music, or listening should I say, rate it 5 out of 5 on iTunes because that really helps sort of bumping those up the ladder, getting more people to listen. So yeah, otherwise, thank you so much for watching or listening to another episode of my Chatterbox podcast. I've been Sir Meerkat, this has been Papa Meerkat, and I'll see all of you Meerkats later. Goodbye, guys. Bye.